Welcome to Every Creature Commission Television and our program, The Protestant Reformation Increasing. And your, your preacher is Brian Mason. Now before I continue with our study in the Acts of the Apostles, it's very much upon my heart to bring before you some scriptures which shows us in these days what is going on. There are so many who are drawn to what? Theory. It's conspiracy theory. But what am I bringing before you? Conspiracy fact. Let us turn to the book of Titus, chapter 1 and the first two verses. Paul a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That is concrete. It is absolute because it is telling us the word of God is telling us that God cannot lie. That's one thing which he cannot do. Yes, and he also will not deny himself. Some versions, now I've read to you from the King James Orthrice version 1611, but there are those versions which alter this instead of saying that cannot lie. And I expose it. The NIV says does, does not. Yes, when he says does not, it means that God could lie. But that is not according to the word of God. It's according to the word of the Antichrist. Because NIV is an instrument of the Antichrist. And I expose it in the light of God today. Let us turn now to the second Epistle of Peter, chapter 2, and the first three verses. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now, in through the Holy Spirit, I expose that there is another Antichrist at work 
there are many antichrists, but one who is so prominent in these days and is being taken in is the Pope Francis I. Because what has been coming out of recent days? That he considers what? Jesus a lie. He what? Cannot accept creation according to biblical Christianity and seeks to speak of God being less than God, God not being all powerful. God is sovereign God. There is none like unto him. And he is omnipotent. The Lord God Almighty reigneth. No matter what Pope Francis I says, he is from the pit of hell because he is one of these false prophets. He is one of these false teachers because he is not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. He is not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord. And he is leading billions, including those who were in the Protestant religion. Where is he leading them? Cut off from God forever to the flames and the tortures of hell. Can you think of it? A place, that awful place, where the souls of those who have rejected Christ, who have been taken in with a counterfeit antichrist, and been dragged down to that place of no escape. Oh, not purgatory. Oh, purgatory. No, never. Because once you have not made your decision in this life to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're cut off from God forever. That can never be when we take Christ as our Savior, when we take Christ as the eternal Son of God, because if Jesus Christ is a lie, then he is not God. He's not co-equal and co-existent with God. And he could not be the Savior. And if he's not the Savior, then there is no Savior. And what? What is the Pope Francis I up to? He's after filling hell. He's already booked his own ticket there. And what's more, he's out to destroy biblical Christianity. And so much of the Protestant Reformed religion has already been drawn into it. What is he out to do? To destroy Judaism. Because he does not support it. He doesn't support the Jews. Biblical Christianity should support the Jews because it is in the word of God that Jew and Gentile alike. There's only one saviour and that's Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, whether we're Jew or whether we're Gentile. Let us be so careful in these days. That is conspiracy fact. That it is the Antichrist at work through the Pope Francis I and through those who have been drawn from Protestant faiths to go and, as it were, for the defeat of this Pope. For they're Antichrist too, no matter who they are. Well, you say, these from America, them, these big ministries, they're not ministries at all. They're synagogues of Satan because they have turned their backs upon biblical Christianity. Had they been still true to biblical Christianity, they would never have gone to Rome and bowed down to the Antichrist Pope. Oh, let us beware in these days of these false prophets. Let us beware of these days of false teachers because they're all over the place. Test them out. Ask them, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Is Jesus Christ the co-equal, co-existent God? Because 
that they cannot say yes. They are the spirit of Antichrist and not the spirit of Christ himself. And also you can tell them by, by what they are. Because when in verse 3 and through covetousness, covetousness, yes, what is most that goes under the name of Christianity today? It's covetousness, seeking the things of the flesh instead of the things of God for the glory of God and the glory of God alone, not for self-satisfaction. No, no, not at all. Are you prepared to stand out in these days in absolute surrender to God, to let him have his way and stand upon the word of God in its entirety. Nothing watered down, nothing altered. But that which is filled with the Spirit of God because it has been written by the Spirit of God. Oh, Father God Almighty, you are sovereign Lord. You are God of heaven. You are God of earth. You are the creator God, the sustainer God, the redeemer God. And that you are still upon thy throne and you will never abdicate thy throne. And I expose in thy light, O oh God, the wicked antichrist system of the Church of Rome and its Pope, Pope Francis I. And, O oh God, these that are in the prison house under him, those who bow down to him instead of committing their lives unto thee. O oh, Father God, take the chains off their hearts, take the scales away from their eyes, and bring them out to see that there is a one God, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that through the Lord Jesus Christ you provided the way unto thyself. No matter what these antichrists might, might say, whatever these false teachers might say, whatever comes against thy word, O God, thy word will stand forever, because thy word says, although heaven and earth may pass away, my word shall stand forevermore. And I challenge thee, O Father God Almighty, that your word has to stand forevermore. That everything in this word, every single word is there to be believed, to be believed and acted upon. And I believe and act upon it and call upon thyself to honor thy word in these days and to pull down th these enemy attacks to expose them into thy light and for the Holy Spirit to dispel the darkness and bring in the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the cleansing power of his blood to show hell-bound sinners that there is a way of escape through repentance through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and coming and kneeling down before the cross of Christ and coming to the only Saviour, the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And through repentance of sin as a gift of God to receive the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash away sin forevermore from the repentant sinner. The Church of Rome cannot do that because it does not see the Lord Jesus Christ as the only mediator, the only one who can deal with sin. I, instead, it seeks to place the works of self it seeks to bring in its indulgences, indulgences which were exposed when the light of the Holy Spirit 
throw Martin Luther and those of the reformers who stood on what? They stood on the unchangeable word of God. O oh, Father God, for thy glory, set those in the bondage of the church of Rome three. Shake it and shake it, Lord, and bring it down at thy feet that those who are held in its sway will see that there is only way, one way unto thyself through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask this, O Father God, in the name above all other names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with our study into the Acts of the Apostles. And we're part way through chapter 10. And we'll continue at verse 22. We saw last time that a man called Cornelius, a centurion, and a man who feared God, that had had a vision, and he called upon Peter. He sent two of his servants and the soldier to Peter in Joppa and requested that he would come and speak what God had to say through Peter. And we left it that these men had arrived at the gate where Peter was staying. And so verse 22, And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that fear of God. Yes, here was a Gentile being spoken of to Peter, who had become a Messianic Jew, and said that Cornelius, yes, was a just man, but above all, he feared God. And where is the fear of God these days? God is treated as something so disrespectfully in these days, as though he was nothing, as though he didn't exist, but here was a man who knew in his heart there to be a God and not only a God but the God the only God who had made himself known in Jesus Christ and this Cornelius, there was a good report about him among the Jews. And that he had been warned by God himself, by the holy angel, to send for Peter to come to his own house to hear what God himself had to say. That's wonderful. Because who is at work here? It is God himself. He was orchestrating what was going on. The one who had orchestrated the creation, the whole of creation, by himself. Not needing anything at all to do with evolution. That evolution is a lie from the very pit of hell to come and seek to blind the ungodly, to keep them in their ungodliness, to keep them from coming to know the Creator God, to keep them from coming to know the Redeemer God. 
and it is again is an antichrist, and I name it before the Almighty God that evolution which is taught these days in the schools, it is of the pit of hell, it is from the devil himself, and I ask thee, O Father God, to deal with this spirit from the pit of hell, and to utterly and completely show it to be a lie, that Instead of the teaching of that, there shall be the return to the teaching of what? Biblical Christianity in these days. Not the teaching of any other gods. Not the teaching of that which is not of thyself but only that which is what brings glory to thyself, O God, and that whilst this stands in the way of the truth of the glorious gospel reaching into the hearts of the children today in the schools, your honor is at stake, O God, and what are you going to do about it? I challenge thee, almighty God, for you to move in sovereign power and sweep away that which prevents, is being preventing biblical Christianity being made known as the way, thy way unto thyself. So, back to the text, chapter 23, I mean, verse 23, Then called he in them and lodged them. Yes, Peter saw that these three men had been sent with a message from God himself. He didn't question them. He didn't send them away. He knew that God was in this. And we have to see in these days that God is still at work. He is still upon his throne. And he will not abdicate that throne. No matter what might come before us through the news, what, might we, what we might read about, hear about, no, it is God when, when what? In the misery, prayer moves the one on the throne. Then, all that is against the plan of God has to give way. Then on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Yes, he was very wise here, was Peter. He didn't go on his own. He took those who would be witnesses with him that whatever came about during that visit, there will be those who will be able to confirm it. When there will be questions asked, undoubtedly there will be questions asked because God was about to do a new thing here. Cornelius on the morrow he was waiting. He knew that Peter would come. Otherwise, what he, in the vision, it wasn't of God if Peter wasn't going to come. And he called together his kinsmen and near friends. He was waiting expectantly. Are you waiting expectantly to see God answer what? The prayers of the Holy Spirit. Not prayers which are for our own self-benefit, but prayers which are in line with the Word of God and for the glory of God. And as Peter was coming in, verse 25, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up! I myself also am a man. Yes, Peter knew his place. He knew that he was not God. But yet what do we see with the popes? Those who what? Treat them as God. He's no, he's no God. No pope has ever been God. 
because they've all been what? Sinners in the sight of a holy God, they've all been contaminated with sin. And unless their sin has been repented of and been cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ, they are still sinners in the sight of God. And even when those who have, whether they be Pope, whether they be anybody, have had their sins forgiven, they're still not God. There's only one God, the God who's made himself known in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's to him, for the word of God speaks so clearly through St. John in chapter 4. They that worship what? Worship God. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. They worship God. Not this man. Not, no, not kissing his hand or a ring. Not bowing down before him. And especially not bowing down to one who for all we know has not repented of his sin, who has not experienced forgiveness of sin, who has not had the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and knows the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Yes, Cornelius first went to his heaven and as he talked with him he went in this, oh, and found many that were come together. Yes, this was Peter going in. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew. Peter, yes, he still considered himself a Jew, but he was a Messianic Jew. He had become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And that a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Yes, in the vision to Peter, the sheet came down and these creatures were in it. But that was God's way of showing Peter that the time had come for not just the Jews to be his people, but the Gentiles, everybody outside of Judaism, was to be given the opportunity to come to know God as their God. On the basis, the same basis of the Lord Jesus Christ having shed his blood for Jew and Gentile alike. Yes, that is why Jew and Jews and Christians should be what? In in link together because they have the same Savior. They have the same Lord because Jesus didn't die one way for the Jews and another way for the Gentiles. He died on the cross for both. And that's why Christians should stand together with the Jews. Because God's plan in His Word, the Bible, Old and New Testament, is in relation to the Jews and in relation to a Jew who became the Savior of the Gentiles as well. So we need to stand together not like Pope Francis, as it were, called shouldering the Jews. No, if he was a Christian, if he had Christ within his heart, he would stand firm with the Jews. And he would stand firm with those who, what, belong to Christ whether Jew or Christian, 
that they could only stand together in Christ when Christ is within our hearts, when Christ is living his own life in and through us. Yes, verse 29, Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. As soon as I was sent for, Peter obeyed. I asked therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? He was absolutely open, was Peter here, to hear what Cornelius had to say, because he knew that what he had to say was to be from God himself. So P Cornelius related to Peter what had happened four days ago when he was fasting. And he was what? He was praying. Yes, he was praying. That word which is so neglected in these days. It's as if prayer is put to the bottom of the list as if it's though it's swept under the carpet as being insignificant. But not prayer which is self-centered. Prayer which is what? In the Holy Spirit. The prayers of the Holy Spirit based on the Word of God. That's what moves the very heart of God. That's what t touches the throne of God and causes God to move. And in response to the prayers of those who are what? Who are His. Those whom, in whom He dwells. And Cornelius, oh, his prayer had what? His prayer had touched the throne of God. Has your prayer touched the throne of God? Do you know what it is to touch the throne of God in the throne room of God? That's what being based on biblical Christianity teaches us. Anything outside of that, anything of the ideas of men cannot do that. Can't move God. The ideas of men will move God into action. They'll move the devil, all right. And to hear these wonderful words, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Oh, what a thing to hear. Thy prayer is heard. And to have that confidence and I have that confidence, Almighty God, Sovereign God, that the prayers of the Holy Spirit that have come through thy vessel today in this, this broadcast, they have touched the throne of God and they will have repercussions on earth. They have shaken the very powers of the devil himself. And he's had to give ground. Say, yes, he made known to Peter that he had to send for Peter to come. And let us move on to verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Yes, how could he see that? It was the Holy Spirit within Peter which showed him that it was of God and God had no divisions that it were. That all the whosoever may come unto God the same way. And that way is through God the Son, the Eternal One, the Creator God, whom what? The Creator God that Pope Francis the First is seeking what to devalue, to make out to be less than God. 
But the word of God shows us so clearly that God himself is no respecter of persons and that whosoever will come to him through the blood of Christ he will accept. But in every nation that feareth him and work of righteousness is accepted with him. Yes, here was Cornelius, a man who was not a Jew. Yet God was showing him through Peter that he was accepted. And he was accepted, so only, uh, yes, only accepted on the basis of Christ, the Son of God. Because no matter who we are, we all have to come that way, not the way of universalism, because universalism will have atheists going. Have you ever heard such nonsense? How can an atheist be accepted in the throne room of God? How can an atheist be accepted in heaven, one who denies that God himself exists? It doesn't tie in with the Word of God. Because the Word of God speaks of being justified by faith. How can an atheist have faith? How can an atheist be justified according to the Word of God? Those who are not believers cannot be justified. So they cannot enter the kingdom of God and what's more, the Son of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ made this so clear to Nicodemus, the Jew who came and inquired of Jesus. Look it up in St. John's Gospel, chapter 3. Yes, unless you're born of what? Again! You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Yes, let's move on then to verse 38. How God, what anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Why was God with him? Because God was within him. He was man with God in him. He came as a man so that he could, what? Redeem those who were humans in order to reconcile man with God. But note, and healing all that were what oppressed of the devil. And anyone today, no matter where they are in the world, billions are still oppressed by the devil himself. Because if you're not in Christ, you're where? Where are you? You're in the devil. It's the devil himself. Because your heart has not been changed. You have not received God into your life when you have not come through God's way. The one, I am the way, the truth and the life. Only Jesus Christ said that. Only he could fulfill that. No other religion or no religion can show you the way to God because you are you will still be in your sin if it's not been dealt with. And because you're in your sin, you're cut off from God. You can't know God. And he went further on to speak in verse 39. And we are witnesses. Yes, Peter was witnessing because he was there when God the Son was nailed to the cross to die for sinners. Oh, when we think about it, God himself stretching out his, his arms 
allowing himself to be submitted into the hands of wicked men, to suffer and to die, that we who deserved absolutely nothing but to be cast into the flames of hell and to suffer torture and torment forevermore, he took our place. He took the judgment which is upon every sinner. He took the wrath of God so that those who repent of their sin and are cleansed through his precious blood are made clean in the sight of a holy God, acceptable before God. And what's more, can come before the very throne of God in confidence that they are accepted forevermore in the person of God the Son. Yes, in Jerusalem, yes, he was, sl he was killed. He was nailed to that cross. Let us never forget that, that it was God himself who went to that cross the evil one had done his worst. Man had done his worst. But God did his best. And it was the very love of God, the Father, which sent the only begotten Son to take your place, to take my place on Calvary's cross. And what happened? Death could not hold him. Other religions, have they got ones who have been raised from the dead? who was standing as the Almighty sat upon the throne. No, they're not. There's only one who has been raised from the dead to be seated at the right hand of God the Father, to have all authority in, in heaven and upon earth. And it's that one which we stand upon in his word. He is the living God, the living Christ. And he lives in and through those who are his. What a privilege we have when we have Christ within. We don't need to be, there's nothing to be miserable about. Nothing to be defeated about. Because we have the joy and the peace and the strength of Christ himself within us. The, the peace that he had within him. The joy which he had within him. Because the person of Christ brings all that God has to give. And what's more, he lives within those who have what? Being born again into the kingdom of God. Have you realized your position in Christ? Because it will transform your life completely. Because you won't be living for yourself. You will be living for God and God alone. When you realize why Christ died for you. To make you God's own possession. And verse 42, And he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God, to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Only one has been ordained by God, God the Son himself, to be what? The judge of the quick and the dead. Yes, the judge of those who will be alive. Those who are alive. And woe betide those who have died without Christ. Be yes, you're either alive in Christ because Christ is in you. Otherwise you are dead and woe betide you. Because you will be cut off from God forever. When you die in your sins. Yes, the clock strikes tonight. And your hour, your minute is it where has come. Are you right with God? Or are you going to that awful place where you'll never be given another chance to repent of your sin and to receive the forgiveness of your sin through the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the difference between 
dead religion or any religion or no religion. There is an absolute certainty here in the word of God. That there is a judge, the day to come. And if you haven't made your mind up in this life, then you won't be given the chance in the other life. That's why purgatory is an absolute nonsense, an absolute lie before God. Because anything which is in the Apocrypha, anything which is outside the canon of God, or anything which is interpreted, misinterpreted, to fit the schemings of what the very devil himself is not of God. Yes, verse 43, to him gave all the prophets what witness. Yes, they pointed to one and to one alone. They pointed to the coming one, and the coming one, the Messiah to the Jews, the Saviour to the Gentiles, and through his name, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That is all comprehensive. That everyone who, through whose name, Jesus Christ's name, believeth, have you believed? In him shall receive remission of sins. There's nothing wishy-washy there, nothing that's left to, to doubt or to chance. It's absolute concrete but there. As I said earlier on, the Word of God, the Bible here, is there for what? To be, to be believed and acted upon. Have you believed these words and acted upon them? And then quite remarkably, in verse 44, we read, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. He didn't have to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. There was a supernatural action from the throne room of God, from the very throne itself. And the Holy Spirit came down in power, came down in the person of the Holy Spirit to indwell each one who was in that house. Those who did not have the Holy Spirit, he came to indwell them as God. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Because if you have not, you don't know what you're missing. Because the Holy Spirit comes to transform. He comes to live as God. He comes to live that life like the Lord Jesus had whilst he was on earth. Because Jesus had dwelling within him, living within him moment by moment, the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Jesus came as man. He came to prove that man could live a holy life and it's because of that that the holy spirit in us enables us to live a holy life not that there's anything within us that merits a holy life we can't live a holy life we can't can't do that which the law tells us what told the jews to do no they can't do only the lord jesus could fulfill the law but when the holy spirit comes in he enables that fulfillment of all that has to be fulfilled. And you might think, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't fulfill that. It's in human thinking, is that? And human thinking doesn't come into it. It is being on a position where we say, I cannot do. And when the heart of God then rejoices, and knowing that you accept it, you can't do it, and you then turn to him and ask him to do it himself through you, because you're the vessel of the Holy Spirit. 
Yes, those of the circumcision, those of the law, they were astonished. As many as came with Peter, that's why he had to have these witnesses with him. He was on his own and gone back and told, told those in Jerusalem what had happened. He had nobody to verify it. But God himself in, God, in sovereign power poured out the Holy Spirit and from that day there was a great movement of God to go with the gospel to the Gentiles. And that great move of God has still to continue today and will continue because I defy everything, O oh God, Father God, which stands in the way, every barrier which stands in the way, whether it be lack of finance or lack of men, I call upon thee, O God, to provide the finance and to provide the men who are, sur who are surrendered to the Holy Spirit so that you can fulfill what? Everything that still needs to be fulfilled in this the Word of God, thine own Word. I thank you for being with me this afternoon as God once more has used his channel to speak and to pray. Our next programs will be at 2.30 and 7 p.m. on Sunday. I trust that you will be able to join in those meetings. Good afternoon.